to this program on improving quality and reducing quality-related costs. This is our opening session, and our subject is proof of the need. Let's begin by stating our objective. Our objective is to develop the habit of annual improvements in quality and annual reductions in quality-related costs. Why do we need annual improvements? We need them to keep our products saleable and our costs competitive. Otherwise, we lose ground to every competitor who does make annual improvements. For a classic example, look at the Japanese revolution in quality. Following World War II, the Japanese tried to convert their industries to civilian products, but they were unable to export due to poor quality. So they launched a revolution in quality. Let's diagram that out with the aid of our mysterious Mystica. In this model, the horizontal axis is time in decades. The vertical axis is quality, saleability of the product. In 1950, Western quality was high. It has kept improving, but at an evolutionary pace. In 1950, Japanese quality was poor. The Japanese then invested in a massive training program. They learned how to improve quality. Then they made quality improvements at a revolutionary pace, year after year. My estimate is that by the mid-1970s, they had equaled Western quality. That revolution has progressively made Japanese products saleable, then competitive, and now, in some product lines, superior in quality. These quality improvements were nearly always accompanied by cost reductions. A classic example is that of the color television set. Until 1974, Quasar was an American-owned color television factory. It was competitive in quality in the U.S. market. Quasar was then sold to a Japanese company who introduced changes in product designs, vendor relations, manufacturing processes, and so on. Look at the effect of those changes on the costs of poor quality. Incidentally, during these sessions, I will be showing many visual aids on this screen, on this Tika, on the TV monitor. Most of these aids are reproduced in your workbook under the tab corresponding to the same session number. The page number will be flashed on the screen. Your workbook will usually include supplemental explanation beyond that contained in my oral presentation. The cost of service calls during warranty declined from 22 million per year down to 4 million. The number of factory personnel needed to find and repair in-house defects declined from 120 to 15. So, the new owners attained the best of both worlds, better quality for the users due to lower field failure rates, and lower costs for the manufacturer. Not only do we need improvement, we need the habit of improvement. To develop that habit, our management team should accept the responsibility for improvement Understand the universal sequence of events through which managers make improvements. Learn the key concepts, techniques, and tools. And finally, apply the universal sequence to actual company problems. Ours is an action program, not merely an educational program. Talking about quality improvement. But what do we mean by that word improvement? First, let us define what we mean by control. Control is the process of detecting and correcting adverse change. Let's explain this by a graph. 
The horizontal scale is time. The vertical scale is performance. Anything that goes up is bad. Now suppose that our past performance has been 10% defective. Suppose also that we've been unable to get rid of that 10%. Typically we conclude, at least let's make sure that things don't get worse. So we set up to measure our actual performance. So long as our actual performance stays close to that 10%, all remains quiet. We have learned to live with that 10%. Subconsciously, we have accepted 10% as a sort of a standard. Now suppose there's a sporadic rise to 20%. That rise triggers many alarm signals. The supervision converges on the scene and takes corrective action. call that firefighting, troubleshooting, and so on. Now, going from 20% to 10% is a sort of improvement, but it is not the kind of improvement we are talking about. What we are talking about is this big chronic area under the 10% line. If we could reduce that 10%, say to 3%, would be a big gain and it would go on and on and on. Reduction in that chronic level is the kind of improvement we are talking about and it is very different from fighting sporadic fires. Now if you wish to explain the distinction between sporadic and chronic to your colleagues, you can use the dialogue between the drunk and the halfwit. The drunk says, you are stupid. And the halfwit says, you are drunk. And the response is, correct, I am drunk. But tomorrow I'll be sober, and tomorrow you will still be stupid. Now, is that chronic loss a fate or a problem? Look at smallpox. Once it was called the scourge of God, a fate beyond the ability of humans to do anything about it. Then some determined humans waded in and look at the history of smallpox in the United States. We see a chronic condition with occasional sporadic peaks. Now smallpox is extinct. It was a problem after all. Any improvement to unprecedented levels we will call breakthrough. We will use those two words, improvement and breakthrough, interchangeably. We define breakthrough as the organized creation of beneficial change. When we review many cases of breakthrough, we find that there is a universal sequence of events through which all managers made their improvements. Let's look at that universal sequence. First, there's proof of the need. Why change what we're doing? Then there's project identification. Specifically, what are we going to tackle? Then comes organization. Organization to guide each project, and organization to diagnose or analyze each project. Then follows diagnosis, a breakthrough in knowledge. Next comes remedial action on the new knowledge, including overcoming resistance to change. And finally, there is control at the new level, holding the gains. This sequence is universal. All breakthroughs follow that sequence. We will use this sequence as our roadmap. The first step is proof of the need.